former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is the only Republican still standing in the way of a third presidential election in a row with Donald J. Trump on the ballot. But she's got an uphill climb ahead of her. She's behind in the polls. She's under pressure from within her own party, and she is facing your constant personal attacks out there on the campaign trail. Nikki Haley is with us now for the moment. Uh, Governor, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Uh, we're at a difficult time in the world. We've got three dead soldiers uh, in Jordan. But that's an opportunity for us to hear how you would think as president uh, when it comes to a response. You said yesterday that you would take out the leadership that's making these decisions. That leadership is located in Tehran. Are you calling for a strike inside Iran? This is not about playing hard in Iran. It's about playing smart. Right. So first you have to look at it was a massive failure when Biden lifted the sanctions on Iran. We know that when Iran gets any money, it fuels its proxies, the Ham Hamas, Houthis, Hezbollah. They always have. I saw that every day at the United Nations. You got to put the sanctions back on. Stop giving them money to kill our soldiers. That's hugely important. The second thing is take out the sites where they're launching those missiles, where they're going. Why did it take now? Yeah. For three soldiers to die, for two Navy SEALs to die, to say, oh, we better do something. It's been 160 strikes. My husband is deployed right now. Yeah. We assume that our country is going to have their backs. They haven't done that. It's a shame. So now go after the launch sites where they're doing that and then go after the leadership. This is surgical. Go after the leadership making these decisions. You take one or two of them out, and that's what you do. You don't bomb Iran. How do you well, make the case, though, to the voters, leader. though, that just hold, say, I can't take it. I can't take but, a, a, the U.S. involved in another but, conflict. But hold on, but this is important, because the leadership is in Tehran. The head yeah. of the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is in Tehran, the capital of Iran. Are you yeah. calling for a strike in his office, bringing it th the fight to him? Well, remember, Soleimani, when we assassinated Soleimani, he wasn't in Iran. They move around. Right. Yeah. This is... It's, it's just surgical. You go and you find a couple of them that are making these decisions, it leaves them flat-footed. They don't care if you kill their proxy fighters. They don't care if you destroy their missiles. What they care is if you take out their money or their leadership. That's how Iran But to Gail's point, um, are you yeah. concerned that... Voters in the country don't have the appetite to get involved in another country. But you know why they don't have the appetite? No one has told them why they should care. Uh -huh. Biden hasn't said it. Congress hasn't said it. You have to over-communicate with the American people. This is not about starting a war. This is about preventing a war. It's always about preventing war. The last thing I want is for my husband to go fight in a war. Same for every military family. So if you get in front of it, you stop it before it starts. Biden waited for people to die. It's too late. You can't do that. But now we've got to stop putting your head in the sand and start dealing with this and telling them what we expect of them instead of being reactionary. It's important. We've got a second opportunity right now to, to see how you would think as president when it comes to the U.S. border. Uh, Senate Republicans and Democrats and the White House have been working out a deal that is way stricter than the current protocols on the border and that would stop immigration totally, according to the Biden administration. And it's bipartisan. And it's bipartisan. Former President Trump is putting his fingers on the scale and saying, don't do this deal, because it's not everything that Republicans want. As president, would you take a deal that gets you a lot of the things you want, but not everything? In other words, compromise. Right now, America's acting like it's September 10th. We better remember what September 12th felt like. It just takes one person to have a 9-11 moment. We are a country of laws. The second you stop being a country of laws, you give up everything this country was founded on. I haven't seen the details of this border issue. No I don't think the president should say, wait until the election to get this done. We can't wait one more day. But what I do think is important that I haven't heard is they don't have the Remain in Mexico policy in that bill. You have to keep people from coming on U.S. soil, period. Mm. Period. They are not vetting a single person here. You can't do that. And what I also know is I saw at the United Nations, you let any people come across the border, they tell their family members, come on over. What did Biden do? He gave temporary protective status to half a million Venezuelans. You know what they did? They picked up the phone and told their family members, come on over. Mm. You've got to stop. They have to know it's not worth making the trek. They have to know that you're going to send them back. When I was governor, we passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued me over it, and we won. We would put a national e-verify program, require businesses to prove that the people they hire are here legally, defund sanctuary cities once and for all, put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job, go back to the Remain in Mexico policy, and instead of catch and release, go to catch and deport. Mm -hmm. That's how you stop it.
Now, when it comes to your campaign, uh, we know what the polls are saying. Uh, former President Trump has a lead, but what are your internal polls saying, especially as we head into South Carolina, your home well, state? First of all, a day in politics is a lifetime, right? Right. So we've got a month until the election. In New Hampshire, I moved 25 points in three weeks. This is where we are anywhere and everywhere in South Carolina. We had 1,000 people in Charleston. We had 1,500 people in Malden. We had um, 1,000 people in Conway. People are showing up because now they're ready to start paying attention. I have a 76% approval rating in South Carolina. They know that I was a good governor. Now I have to show them I'll be a good president. But, so, go but Governor, as we sit here today, as the children of today say, the math isn't mathing for you, even in your own home state. Why do you think that you still appear to be struggling in your own home state? And what message does that send to the rest of the country if the people in your own home state right now, you're trailing Donald Trump, that you're not deterred by that clearly? I mean, look, it, this is just getting started. I just got to South Carolina. We just left New Hampshire. My goal has always been to keep building. We had 14 people in this race. I took out the fellows one at a time. We started at 2%, we ended at 20% in Iowa. We went to New Hampshire, we got 43%. Guess what that means? Yeah. Donald Trump didn't get 43% of the people. You can't win an election like that. You can't not do that. Now our goal in South Carolina, come in even stronger. That's what we're gonna focus on doing. But yeah. look at what happened right after the election. After the New Hampshire election, Donald Trump threw a temper tantrum on stage because I got 43%. And then in that time, grassroots across the country, we raised a million dollars because of how he acted and how I acted. Yeah. Then the next day he goes and says, anybody that supports Nikki Haley is not gonna be part of MAGA. Mm. Really, you're gonna go, these are people you need to win an election. Yeah. That got people fired it's up. It's carry weight, we, though. We put T-shirts that said barred permanently. But we sold 15,000 T-shirts. We raised 1.6 million. People listen to him. His words, words carry weight. But listen, yes. then after that, he goes to the Republican Party and says, you know, make me the nominee. Say yeah. I'm the nominee. After that, we raised another 1.4 million. People don't want a coronation. It's been two states. But look at you have to have 12, 1,215 delegates. Yeah. He has 32. I have 17. That's nothing. That's not nothing. Governor, I, I want to get your thoughts real quick. We have to go. Um, he did get you confused with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, you've worked with him closely. You've known him for quite some time. Do you truly believe he is suffering from cognitive decline? Are we really in this country going to have two 80-year-olds running for president? It is a fact that when you are their age, you have mental decline. I don't care who you are, you have mental decline. He didn't just get me confused. He mentioned it over and over and over again. Mm, yeah. He's not what he was in 2016. He has declined. Mm. That's a fact. Joe Biden's declined in the two years since he's been president. The party that goes and puts a new generational leader in is the party that will win. That's why I'm running. I don't want my kids to live like this. Yeah. If you're going to have eight solid years, you yeah. can't put a guy in their 80s so in there to go You're not it. dropping out. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> always, everybody always says that, though. I'm not going What's anywhere. interesting on the yeah. age polls is the older the person polled, the more likely they are to support age limits. Yeah. Older people know. Governor, uh, we know Thank that you're very busy. Thank you so much. Oh, go to NikkiHaley.com and join us. There it is.